Our New Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 12. Hear the word of God. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us pray. Lord, we ask right now that you would grant us understanding of your word, both this Old Testament story about Jacob and the dream he had, and Paul's writing to the Romans about being led by the Spirit of God. Open up our hearts, Lord, and make these words real to us. Give the light of understanding so that we can take these words and grasp them so that they can become a, a seed that takes root within us, grows, transforms us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. That Old Testament reading that, that Debbie gave us this morning, of course, focused on Jacob and his surprise encounter with God. Now, what do you remember about Jacob from your Sunday school days or from Bible study times when you studied his life? Well, we know that he was the son of Isaac and, and the grandson of Abraham. Perhaps you also recall that he had some character flaws. He, he was the kind of person who would scheme and who would deceive to get what he wanted. Now his brother Esau was the firstborn. In the Old Testament times, the firstborn male received the birthright. And, and the birthright has to do with inheritance of goods and in the position of importance in the family. Now granted, Esau was not very bright. Esau was ruled by his stomach and his impulses and Jacob knew this. Jacob also understood the importance of that birthright. Esau didn't quite get it. One day Esau came in from the fields and he was famished, he was hungry. Jacob recognized an opening there, the possibility of, of acquiring Esau's birthright. So Jacob had this big bowl of stew in front of him and he offered this big bowl of stew to Esau in exchange for his birthright. Well, Esau's stomach and impulses got the better of him, and he agreed to exchange his birthright for a bowl of stew. Later, when it came time for their father Isaac to bestow his patriarchal blessing upon the oldest, upon Esau, Jacob stepped in again using deception. Conspiring with his mother, Rebekah, they used the skins of two kid goats to make the smooth-skinned Jacob appear like his hairier brother Esau. Now Isaac, who by now was almost blind, he, he reached out and, and he touched his goat hair that Jacob had, had put on, and he was convinced it was Esau, so Isaac, Isaac gave Jacob the patriarchal blessing, which was very important. This was God's 
great blessing of abundance. You know, may, may you have many children. May your offspring grow to be a great nation so that other nations will bow down to you. It's a very important blessing. After Jacob left, Esau entered the room, ready to receive the blessing. And of course, Isaac was devastated because there wasn't anything to do. He had already given away that blessing to Jacob. And so Esau was furious. And right there, he made a vow that he would kill his brother, Jacob. That brings us to today's passage of Scripture from Genesis 28. Here we find this fugitive, Jacob, fleeing from his angry brother. He was seeking refuge at his father-in-law's house in, in Bethuel. And there... He had to stop along the way because night had fallen. So we have this, this schemer, this, this man who, who had lived a conflict-ridden life, full of deception, full of self-serving. And now he had this big threat hanging over his head of, of his brother killing him. So his future was uncertain. And so he stops here to, to camp for the night. He finds this pillow and, and he lays down and he uses this stone, not pillow, this stone, and he uses it for a pillow and he falls asleep at this desperate place in his life. Jacob was in limbo. He, he was landless. He was rootless. He had no prospects for the future. This is where God meets Jacob. This is where God intervenes in Jacob's life. God breaks into Jacob's sleep through a dream. In this dream, Jacob looked up and he saw this stairway to heaven. Then, then he looked up and he saw God and he encountered God and God spoke to him directly. God said to him, I am the Lord. The God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac, I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and the south, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and through your offspring. God interrupted Jacob's anxious journey to say, Jacob, I am opening up a new door for you. My grace is extending to you. I'm not going to count your past sins and deceptions against you. Rather, I'm going to extend forgiveness to you and draw you near to me and help to open up your eyes so that you can see this opportunity, this open door that I am placing before you. This is your chance to turn from your selfish, deceiving ways and become a blessing to the whole world. Well, how did Jacob respond? Jacob realized that this was a special moment in his life. He realized this was his first real encounter with God. This was his stairway to heaven. He would never be the same after this moment when he encountered God on a personal level. He stands up. He looks at the ground around him and he realizes how special this place is. He builds an, an altar and then he converts that stone pillow into the pinnacle of that altar. And he says, how awesome is this place? It is where I met God. It is where the gate of heaven opened up to me. And then he vowed that God would be his God and that he would be God's man. And this trickster, Jacob, was transformed into a man richly blessed through whom the whole world would also be blessed. Now, when, when I was a younger fellow in high school, there was a, a group, one of my 
my favorite rock bands by the name of Led Zeppelin. Has anyone ever heard of them? Led Zeppelin? Few of you have. In high school, they had a hit song called Stairway to Heaven. The first line of that song was, there's a lady who's sure all that glitters is gold, and she's buying a stairway to heaven. Now, Led Zeppelin's lyrics were always a, a little strange, but even as, as a, a young guy, I, I kind of interpreted that line to me that people with lots of money can surround themselves with material and worldly things. Beautiful homes and new cars and exotic vacations and all the latest technological toys. They can kind of establish their own heaven. They can buy their stairway to heaven. As an 18-year-old, that rock star lifestyle was very attractive to me. I think most young guys back then, maybe even today, wanted to be rock stars. To be able to be famous and, and rich and, and kind of create our own heaven, buy our, our own stairway to heaven. And although that lifestyle was very attractive to me, I knew deep inside it was a deception because many of these rock stars of my day were self-destructive. A lot of them overdosed on drugs and killed themselves. For example, Jimi Hendrix and, and Janis Joplin died of overdoses. And that would make me think if, if, if they're doing so well, if they have everything, why, why are they so empty? Why are they using drugs? Why are they overdosing? Even one of the members of Led Zeppelin, I believe, the drummer, died by choking on his own vomit after a, a night of drinking. So I was smart enough, even as an 18-year-old, to know that you really can't buy a stairway to heaven. I went on to college, then after I graduated, and at that time on the campus of, of West Liberty, my spiritual eyes began to open up to another stairway to heaven, I began to encounter these young people whose lives overflowed with this joy and, and this hope and, and this love. I, I sensed when I was around them there was something different about them. They had things in their lives that were missing in, in my life. And they attributed it to the Spirit of Christ dwelling inside of them. And this was totally new to me. Even though I grew up in, in the Presbyterian Church in downtown Martin's Ferry, what in the world were they talking about? The Holy Spirit of God making a home inside of you and then opening up your eyes to the kingdom of God, to eternal life. Now, I'm, I'm sure teachings about the Holy Spirit were presented at the Grace Presbyterian Church when I was a young person. I just wasn't paying attention. That thing. I, I, I didn't have my focus on the right things back then. But I could not remember anyone ever overflowing with the power of the Spirit. Again, I probably just wasn't paying attention. As I began, though, to read and study the Bible for myself, I discovered these young people were on to something. I would read a passage like the Scripture lesson from the New Testament today. Romans 8, 12-14. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it, for if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. And a verse like that would speak to me about these rock stars who lived in excess and ended up ruining their lives. Then it said, for if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if the Spirit, by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Then it hit me. We become sons and daughters of our Creator God by the power of the Spirit. The Spirit puts to death and then brings new life. The Apostle Paul told the Romans that when the Spirit of God is conceived within you, 
it has the power to put to death all those negative things that are in your life. Those, those things that the Bible calls things of the flesh. It has the power to put those things to death, but then it doesn't stop there. It brings the life of God into us. The Spirit leads us in this relationship with God. And we begin to, to sense and be filled with the life of God. Paul, Paul said in, in verse 15, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to those fleshly things, to fear and all those other things, but rather you received a spirit of sonship, and in him we cry, Abba, Father. So the Spirit leads us to this understanding that, that God is not only our Creator, but God is our Father. And that Greek word here, used for Father, is even more intimate than we, than we would see on the surface. It is the same word that is used for Daddy. The Spirit brings us into that kind of relationship with God, like a child son or daughter with his or her dad. Now my kids uh, call me dad. There goes one up right there. <laughs> Lately though I've been called happy a lot. That's, that's such a warm feeling. I, I, I get home and one of my grandsons are there. Happy! Well that is what that relationship is like that God leads us to by the Spirit. Abba, Father, Daddy. That is the kind of relationship we are led into. And as the Spirit begins to move in our lives, we discover the Spirit changes us. The Spirit gives us more patience, more love, more, more compassion. We, we learn to, to, to focus on more important things in life. And I remember even as a young man, I, I felt this compassion growing inside. I decided to walk over to the Marks Ferry Hospital. I don't, I don't think it was called the East Ohio Regional Hospital back then. But I decided to just to walk over there and visit sick people. And I remember walking into a room of a man who was, who was dying of cancer. I had no idea who he was. I just walked over and visited him, sat with him for a while, and, and talked to him. But the Spirit, the Spirit led me there. I discovered the Spirit of God was changing me, fine-tuning how I respond and react to the things that were happening around me. Basically, what the Spirit does is He makes us more like the Son our Lord Jesus Christ. So in conclusion, I just want to say the stairway of heaven is discovered by those who are led by the Spirit. Amen. Let's turn to our final hymn, number 371.